Good morning and happy Sabbath family. I am Tiffany Claiborne and I love studying the word of God with God's people. Family, I am so excited to be with you on this Sabbath morning and I'm looking forward to what God is going to reveal to us through his word this morning. Now, family, you know what we do as you come in, say good morning, say happy Sabbath, and let us know how good God has been to you. It is testimony time. Donna Nita, good morning and happy Sabbath, sis. I am so happy to see you here this morning. Again, family, join Donna Nita, say good morning, say happy Sabbath, and let us know what has God done for you over the last seven days? I know that God has been good to you. Miss Vivian, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's always good to see you. Again, I do hope you all are ready to dive deeper into God's word. There are a lot of things that God wants us to learn today. So I'm excited about the lesson God has for us. Robert, good morning and happy Sabbath, brother. It is good to see you on this Sabbath morning. Again, family, as you're coming in, say good morning, say happy Sabbath, and let us know your testimony. Gerald, good morning, my brother. It's good to see you this Sabbath morning. Pat, good morning and happy Sabbath. Thankful that God granted us a good and quick vacation. God is good. Glad you got back safely and glad you had a wonderful time. Mona Lisa, what's up, girl? Happy Sabbath. Good to see you. Aaron and the fam, good morning and happy Sabbath, girl. Good to see y'all. Elise, good morning and happy Sabbath. Yes, the Holy Spirit. Come on now. So happy to hear that the Holy Spirit is working in and through you, sis. Tiff, good morning and happy Sabbath. Yes, God is truly, truly good. Richard, happy Sabbath to you as well. God has been good to me so that I can keep on staying in this house, sitting for another view. I think you mean a view of this Sabbath school or you mean a view of outside. Let us know. Either way, praise God, brother. We're always happy to see you. Lauren, good morning and happy Sabbath, sis. It's good to see you. Christy, good morning and happy Sabbath. Feeling blessed and happy. God is so good. Isn't he good? Desiree, I like the new photo, girl. Happy Sabbath to you. David, good morning and happy Sabbath, brother. Yes, the beautiful view. Thank you so much for letting us know about that, Richard. Feliz Sabado. Yes, good to see you, Juanita. Sunshine, good morning and happy Sabbath to you, sis. Again, family, I hope you are ready to dive deeper into God's word this morning. Now, we're going to end a little bit earlier than usual. 11 o'clock, only about 15 or 20 minutes earlier. So I'm going to dive right into our lesson for today. Hold on one second. Hello and happy Sabbath to you, Facebook user. Good to see you. Desiree, my husband and I celebrated 11 years of marriage. Oh, you will tomorrow. Praise God for 11 years of marriage. God is truly good. Don't I need to thankful for the challenges God has allowed this week that caused me to fall, come on, to my knees before him. God is truly good. Praising God that he drew you closer to him this week. God is truly, truly good. Robert, God blessed me with Holy Spirit power and insight to give me patience and meekness beyond myself and a glimpse of how far I still have to go in spiritual growth. Praise God. God is truly good, brother. So glad you were able to see God throughout the experiences you had this past week. God is truly, truly good. Now, family, I want to jump right in. Let me ask you this question as we're getting into our lesson, the basic foundation of our lesson for today. Ah, hold on. Melanie, so glad you are here as well, sis. Good to see you this Sabbath morning. Here's the question, family. If someone asked you, who God is, how would you describe God? If someone walked up to you and said, Hey, who is God? Can you tell me who God is? Can you explain him to me? How would you personally describe God to someone that asked you this question? Miss Robin, good morning and happy Sabbath. God has been so good to me that I'm able to work from anywhere. Come on now. 
enjoying your vacation, enjoying the sun, probably enjoying the beach. God is good. Sunshine, this week I learned that failure is the embryo to breakthrough. Come on now. God can use any situation. Amen. Christian, good to see you back. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Tiff says, in explaining who God is, loving, kind, forgiving, and our protector. Amen. Robert, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all. Sunshine, my best friend. Amen. Amen. Donanita, he is my everything, my savior, redeemer, and friend. Amen. Melanie, he's the creator of the universe. Robert, the only one who knows all about us and loves us in spite of it all. Pat, God is my creator and the one who is relentless in loving me and wants to spend eternity with me and with you. Amen. Aaron got a testimony. I've been praying for a position where I can work from home, make the amount of money I need and be able to pick my daughter up from school. I just completed my first week. Come on, God. And I'm so grateful. Praise God for that testimony. We're so happy that God answered your prayers, God. Um, uh, Aaron, <laughs> God is truly good, girl. Desiree, God is the creator of all. He is my provider and God is love. Amen. Good morning, Garfield. Good to see you. Elise, God is in whom we live and move and have our being. God is. Amen. Yes. Amen. Don Anita. Lauren, he is so patient, loving, and merciful. My redeemer. Amen. Elnora blessings to you. Yes. And God is truly our biggest blessing. Richard everlasting and all forgiving love. Amen. Sunshine. True that all of it. Yes. Garfield happy and blessed Sabbath to one and all same to you, brother. Robert, the one with the answer to all the problems and the power to make it happen according to his will. Amen. Lauren Levi. Hey, Levi, it's good to see you. I hope you enjoy our class today. <laughs> Marie, good morning to you, sis. Happy Sabbath. All right. And God is my guide. Amen. Family, we have all of these ways of describing who God is, our father, our protector, the one who loves us. I want us to jump to our first Bible verse, Genesis chapter one, and we're going to look at verse 27, Genesis chapter one. And we're going to look at verse 27 because we just talked about who God is to each and every one of us, how we would describe him to someone else. But what does Genesis one verse 21, seven say verse 27 say, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Very first book of the Bible, very first chapter, and we're seeing that God created human beings in his image. This is where the foundation of our lesson is found for today. Now the comment came through Christy. He is everything to me, the ruler of this universe. He is the redeemer, my redeemer, my friend, and my everlasting father. Amen. Robert, the only one who actually delights in mercy. He gets excited and not giving us the punishments we deserve. God is truly, truly good. I want us to jump into the first part of our lesson, the foundation for our lesson today. Genesis 1 27, we just read, spoke about God creating man in his image. So who is God? Exodus 34 verse six and seven say, and the Lord passed by before him, speaking of Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and unto the third and to the fourth generation. In other words, he is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundance in goodness and truth and forgiving. Psalms 86, five says for thou Lord art good and ready to forgive 
and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Good, ready to forgive, and merciful. And Psalms 86 verse 15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full, full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Family, God is compassionate. He's gracious, he's long-suffering, he's merciful and full of truth. Remember, the Bible said we were made in his image, and now we're seeing who God is. I want to say good morning to Pamela. Good morning, sis, and happy Sabbath to you. We're happy to see you here this morning. So, family, we see the descriptions of God in his own word. So why is it important for us to know who God is. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we, you and I, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And Ephesians 4.24 says, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I want to pause really quickly before I give the summary for our foundation of today's lesson. Out of the characteristics that we saw from the four different verses, the characteristics of God, which characteristic do you feel is sometimes the most challenging for human beings to reflect? Remember, we saw that God is merciful, he's kind, he's good, he's long-suffering, he's forgiving, he's merciful. But Genesis 1.27 said, he created us to be in his image. And if his image encompasses all of these wonderful things, in your opinion, which one is the most challenging? As human beings, we know that we've been affected by sin. And right now in 2022, out of those characteristics, which one do you think is the most challenging for us as Christians? We love God and we want to reflect his image, but which one is the most challenging? Shawnette, good morning. I think it's your first time, sis. Happy Sabbath. I'll do the welcome in a moment, but welcome, sis. We're happy to have you. Lauren says forgiving. It is hard to forgive sometimes. It is definitely hard. Tiff, forgiveness can definitely be challenging. Juanita, to be loving and merciful. Yes, we're talking about the Bible saying God wants us to be in his image, but sometimes it's a little bit challenging. Marcus, what's going on, brother, says forgiveness. Elise, long suffering is the most challenging. Pat, granting mercy. Elnora, long suffering, not easy. Desiree, long suffering is the most challenging because we get so impatient. Sunshine, merciful in relation to healing of sick and those facing death. Wow. Marcus, kindness. Family, there are so many aspects of God's character that can be a bit challenging for us to reflect. But why is it so important? You see, Ellen White says, The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. So we're talking about these things that can be challenging to forgive others, to be long suffering. Robert says, so we can see that we are to emulate as the Holy Spirit is transforming God's image back into us. Mercy, long-suffering, forgiveness, compassion in that order. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you as well, Valesia. Good to see you. Catherine, hey, Catherine. Good to see you, sis. I think it's your first time, but I'll welcome you in a moment. Long-suffering, yes. Happy Sabbath, Gertrude Garfield. Long-suffering and forgiveness, yes. Don Anita, forgiveness is challenging, but the forgetting is what holds me back. Yes, that forgetting is definitely a challenge. So why is it so important? We saw in Ellen White's quote from the book Desire of Ages, the very image of God needs to be reproduced in humanity. 
The reason why we struggle is because sin is so present in our world now. But God says when your image changes to my image, when you're kinder, when you forgive, when you show that you are merciful to others, when you allow the Holy Spirit, as Robert mentioned, to work through you, to reproduce my image in you, the world will change. This is why it's so important for us, family, to go to God and to ask him to change us each and every day. Yes, Marcus, rejoicing in tribulation. These things are so important for us. And once again, the very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. And this is what we are going to get into today. Let's bow for prayer. God, thank you again so much for bringing us together, Lord, to dive deeper into your word. God, we want to represent you, Lord, when we're in front of our family members, our friends, and those that we don't even know. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word today and to understand it. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. All right, I think another comment came through. Elnora, long-suffering. I got you. No worries, sis. Catherine, good morning, girl. Good to see you. Kim, good morning and happy Sabbath. Now, family, before we continue, you know we like to do the welcome. So if it is your first time, please let us know in the comment section. I already saw a few names that I think were first-timers. Let us know in the comment section. You're only a guest one time. And after that, you're automatically a member of the Sabbath School Live family. But we really want to say welcome. We're so happy that you're joining us and you're showing that you also want to understand more about God's word. So let us know. We want to welcome you and we hope you enjoy your time with us today. Robert says, forgetting is not a requirement of forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting go of making them pay you back, not forgetting it happened. This is a study I would love to do because I want to know your thoughts on this, Robert, because the Bible also says that Jesus will throw our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. So he himself will forget what we've done. I want to know your thoughts on that. Again, I love Bible study, but I'll throw that out there. I want to hear your response on that. Uh, Garfield, when people do you wrong, our natural instinct is to react. It only is only the power Oh, the power and spirit of Christ that will enable us to forgive. Very true. Lenzel, good morning and happy Sabbath. Good to see you. Desiree says, welcome to everyone. Catherine, I thought so. Everyone, please welcome Catherine Prescott Adamitz. Hopefully that's the right pronunciation of your name. We are so happy that you are joining us this morning. This is a very interactive class and it is a family. So Catherine, please feel free to comment. We want to know what God has revealed to you as we go throughout our lesson study. But family, please say happy Sabbath and welcome Catherine. If there are any other first timers, let us know in the comment section. We want to welcome you as well. Madeline, good morning and happy Sabbath to you, sis. Christy says, welcome. Gerald says, welcome, Catherine. Tiff, welcome to our Sabbath school family, Catherine. We are so happy that you are here. Again, family, welcome, Catherine. We are so happy that you are here with us. Mona Lisa says, welcome, Catherine, and nice to worship with you all and the family. God is truly good. So again, continue welcoming her in the comment section, family. Uh, Garfield says, welcome, Catherine. Robert says, welcome all the new family members. And Catherine, you are most welcome. We are happy that you are here with us. And again, welcome to all of our other family members. I hope that you will all be blessed this morning and that we all will learn even more together. Sunshine says, welcome, Catherine. So happy you're here with us. Happy Sabbath, dear. Jeremy, what's going on, brother? Good morning and happy Sabbath. And he says, welcome to you as well, Catherine. All right, family, as we're moving forward, I want to ask you all this question. We have the foundation for our lesson. And now I want to ask you this question. I want you to, can you name some things that are extremely expensive? Some things that right now in 2022, you know for a fact they are extremely expensive. 
not slightly, but extremely expensive. Put those things in the chat area. What are some things that are extremely expensive? And while you're typing, David says, welcome, Catherine. What a blessing to have you here. God is good. Mavelyn, welcome, Catherine. Our teacher is a beast. Oh, praise God at breaking down the lessons. God is good. Thank you so much. Elise, welcome all Sabbath school family members. And Catherine, you are now a part of the family. So true. Bryant, yes, family. One of our members has a birthday today. Misi, I think you're also watching too. Hey, girl. So I want to sing happy birthday to Misi. Bryant, thank you so much, brother, for letting us know. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Misi. Happy birthday to you. Y'all show some love to Misi. Happy birthday, girl. I hope you have an awesome day. Enjoy it. Eat the food you want. And Bryant, please spoil your wife. All right, family, let her know you love her and say happy birthday. Desiree says houses. Yes. Y'all, I remember in the early 90s, if your house cost $100,000, you were living in a huge house. But now in 2022, $100,000 is not going to get you the same house it would have gotten you in the early 90s. So yes, houses are extremely expensive. Tiff, homes, luxury cars, tuition, and school loans. Yep. Richard, a top Nokia camera. Exactly. Linzel, diamonds. Yes. Marcus, buying a home, right? Jeremy, housing market. Listen, as you can tell, many of us are looking into buying a house not cheap. Exactly. Valencia, electric cars. Janice, good morning. Homes. Exactly. Now, Janice, is it your first time here with us or just your first time commenting? Because I think it may be your first time. If it is, welcome. Good to see you. Brian, my wife and kid are expensive. <laughs> and they're going to be more expensive when you take her out to dinner later tonight. <laughs> Robert, being ignorant is super expensive. Wow. Okay. You went there. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sunshine, education, gas, groceries, and medical care. True. Mona Lisa, houses, especially in Southern California. True. Maureen, good morning and happy Sabbath. I don't know why I'm not getting your notifications. I'm not sure either, but sis, you know, 945 on the dot. I'm always here unless I'm on vacation. Good to see you here, though. Yes, Gerald, college. Desiree says, happy birthday, Missy. Jeremy says, happy birthday. All the birthday wishes. I'll pop them on the screen for you, girl. Donna Nita, God throws out sins into the sea of forgetfulness. How much more should we? Amen. Part of forgiveness is learning to let go altogether. Amen. Garfield, I'm requesting your prayers for thanks of Thanksgiving for my birthday, 727. My anniversary, 723. Our daughter's 18th birthday, 712. God has blessed us with another year. And it seems like July is your month, brother. Definitely we'll be keeping you guys in our prayers and praising God for all that he has done for you in the month of July. Raw, hey, what's going on, brother? Gas is expensive. Marine, vacations. Elise, a new car. Gertrude, health care. Ife, good morning, girl. Richard, if you are looking for a home in Cape Town, give me a call. I am a real estate agent. Hey, praise God if you're going to Cape Town. Ife, cost of living. Yes. Marine, true, Robert. Hey, right there, connection. Garfield, living in these times is very expensive. True. Jeremy, yes, July is definitely a great month. So, family, we all know that there are many things that are expensive. I want us to jump to this verse. First Peter chapter one, and we're going to look at verse seven, first Peter chapter one. And I want us to look at verse seven, first Peter chapter one, looking at verse seven. Now the comment, yes, it is. You're welcome, brother. You're welcome. Here we go. First Peter chapter one and verse seven, trusting that all have found. It says, we're talking about things that are expensive and valuable. Verse seven says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than a home, being much more precious than an expensive car, being much more precious than that uh, Sally Mae loan, <laughs> much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This verse is letting us know that the trials of our faith, that trial is actually worth more than gold. Why is this true? How can we understand this verse more? We're going to dive deeper into this. Hold on one second. Mo, good morning and happy Sabbath, girl. Good to see you. Robert, to the questions of Christ casting all our sins into the depths of the sea, Micah 7, 19, has the word will in front of it. And verse 16 of Micah 7 shows that this is in reference to the final judgment, not before. All right. Hey, I think the main thing was the fact that he is going to forget. And I think we also, when someone hurts us, we have to use wisdom, but we don't want to keep bringing it up and putting it in their face. But definitely a topic I would love to get into uh, for another Bible study. I love it. Mo, family's in town, but had to jump on to say good morning, fam. Good morning to you. Enjoy your fam, Mo. Pat, forgiveness is often confused with reconciliation. Forgiveness is a choice we make to not hold anger and bitterness in our heart. Reconciliation should happen when both parties have humbled themselves and done the work to establish healthy boundaries. Otherwise, you are entering into an unhealthy relationship. We see the example of Joseph forgiving and reconciling with his brothers, but we do not see him reconciling with Potiphar's wife, although I'm sure he forgave her. Very good points. Very good points, Pat. Thank you so much. Here we go, family. So Monday's lesson. Faith amid the refining fire. According to the Bible, what is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5 says, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. So again, faith is again, the substance of things we hope for. It's not by what we can actually see. It's by what we believe found in God's word. And finally, that our faith should stand in the power of God. So I want us to take a look at Job chapter 23 verses one to 10. Job's faith didn't falter in the midst of fire. So verse two, when the trials and burdens got heavy for Job, even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Let me pause really quickly. We've all heard the story of Job, right? All of the things that happened to Job. I want to ask you all a question out of all the trials that Job experienced before he approached God, which one do you think was the most difficult? Remember he lost his children. He lost some of his, well, all of his cattle. He lost his wealth and his family. Which part do you think was the most difficult out of his trials? In your opinion, if you were in Job's situation, which one would have brought you to your breaking point? I know the one that it would have brought me to my breaking point. But thinking about the life of Job and when the devil came to attack Job after asking God for forgiveness, excuse me, for permission, which trial do you think was the most difficult? Which trial do you think, listen, God, this one, uh-uh, this is just too much, God. Pat says losing his children. I can't even imagine. Yes, Richard losing his children. Marie losing his children. Christy losing his family. Catherine losing family. Tiff losing your family and children. Sunshine losing your family. Mona Lisa, I think losing my whole family would break me. Lindsay losing the children. Ghislaine, good morning, sis. God's silence. Wow, good point. Was the hardest. Good morning, brother Taylor and sister Taylor. Good to see you. David losing his family mercy can't even imagine losing my children. So family, we can all agree. Job went through a lot and losing his children. Lauren says, I agree losing his children and not understanding why Robert, not knowing why, when you know you and God is straight, you know, you're in your word. You know, you're praying. You know, you and God, ace, boom, coom. What is going on? Losing your children, Gerald, says Marcus, not understanding why God would allow him to suffer. 
at least long suffering as he endured the words of his friends, family. We can all imagine the stress he was experiencing. We know the backstory because we have God's word, but Job did not know what was going on in heaven. So now we're coming to the point, Job's breaking point. And this is what Job said. Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. What I'm going through right now is just too difficult. It's, it's more than I can bear, Lord. This is where I am. I have lost my children. I don't know what's going on. My friends are coming at me. And God, I just for the life of me cannot figure out why this is happening to me. This is where we are in Job's story. But let's continue after he's voiced what he's experiencing and how he's feeling. Look at what happened. In verse 3. Job said, where is God? He says, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. God, I wish I knew where you were. We've all been in that experience, right? We've all had that experience. We're going through trials. Things are happening. Loved ones are passing away. We're, we're losing jobs. We're not having enough money to do certain things. Our friends are coming at us, our coworkers, and we're like, God, Man, I wish I knew where you were, bro, because I can't feel you. This is what Job was experiencing. Psalm 72, verses 2 to 9, they say, In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night, and I ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I want to pause, family. We've all been here going through things, and we, we try to think of the, the songs that encourage us, right? My help, all of my help cometh from the Lord. We think of these songs when we're going through these trials. This is what was happening in the book of Psalms. Continuing, I think of the songs. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean, gone forever? I want to pause real quick. Real quick. I'm going to put a pin in that. When I read this, I said I had to check and see if I was reading the King James Version. If you're from America, Maryland, D.C. area, we used to say, yo, that's clean, out, like clean, like completely. I said, wait a minute. This is some slang in the Bible. I'm going to read it again. Here we go. It says, is his mercy clean, gone forever, straight out of here? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? This is what was happening to Job. Did I miss something? Does God no longer care for me? All of these trials are happening back to back to back, and I just can't seem to feel God with me. This is what Job was going through. Robert, exactly when God is silent, Lord, the faith to trust you through the quiet times when we are tortured by adversity. Exactly. And this is what Job was going through. And then verse four, I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. The next thing that happened is Job says, listen, let me review my life. I'm searching for God. And as I search for God, I'm also looking back over my life. I, I can't find anything that I've done, any sin that I've committed that would cause me to go through these trials. I would tell God, I would plead my case. This is what was happening to Job. And he's looking now for God's response. Verse five, I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Job is just curious. He wants to know. He is actually in the fire. And he's wondering where God is. Part two. Now we see verse six and seven. Woo! Will he plead against me with his great power? 
No, he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. Trusting in God's strength despite the situation and seeking his presence. From verse 1 to 5, we saw Job crying out like, where is God? I don't understand why this is happening. And then there's this switch. Job says, it's all good. I trust in him despite what I'm going through. I am going to trust in God's strength. Vanessa, good morning, Sith. Good to see you. Happy Sabbath. The Bible tells us in Psalms 138 verse 3, God strengthens us when we cry out to him. The verse says, in the day when I cried, thou answeredest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. And 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 says, God said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. You see, family, Job understood that God's strength is felt When we are at our weakest, we're talking about faith amid the refining fire. Job was in the fire and he remembered when I am weakest, that's when God is strong. He was focusing on God's power. Verses eight and nine. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there and backward, but I can't perceive him on the left hand where he doth work but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. Job is now expressing the fact that he could not feel God's presence. Psalms 89 verse 46 says, how long Lord wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Holding on when it seems like God is hiding. And Isaiah 8, 17 lets us know that we will wait on the Lord if we wait on the Lord, even when he's hiding his face and we continue looking for him, waiting on God, no matter what. This is what it looks like to have faith amid the refining fire. And verse 10, but he knoweth the way I take. Come on, Job. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You talking about a switcheroo. The beginning of Job's speech, God, I don't know what's going on. I'm looking back over my life and I can't see anything that I've done that would cause these trials to come upon me. God, I don't know where you are. I can't feel you. Job was expressing the same feelings we experience, family. When we go through all of these trials, when we go through the fire and we can't seem to feel God's presence. But Job ended this entire speech by saying, ha. But when God hath tried me, I will come forth as pure gold. Family, God needs us to have faith in the midst of the fire. Faith in the midst of our trials. It's okay. We can recognize the difficulties. We can recognize they're challenging. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was like, God, bruh, this is rough. If you can take this cup from me, please do but not my will, your will. It's okay to acknowledge the challenges that we're going through, but our final statement needs to be not my will, but your will, because I know God that after this trial, I will come forth as pure gold because of you. This is what Job knew. James one verses two to four. My brethren counted all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, That the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Listen, man, this verse, these verses by themselves could be an entire study family. The trials that we go through are literally to help us come forth as gold. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow and the next week and the next month and the next few years. He knows what needs to be done to get us stronger so that we can make it through the times that are coming and finally go to heaven with him. So we need to praise him 
when the trials come. It sounds so weird, but God says, praise me when the trials come because you know that I'm actually strengthening you through the trials. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hey, Tanisha, good to see you, girl. Yes, praise God for the trials. Amen. No dross remaining. Only God's image of patience, long-suffering, meekness, singleness of focus on God as our all in all. Amen. Two more verses. First Peter 1 verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. We read that earlier and also Malachi 3 verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth for God, our father is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. God, our father is a refiner's fire. So the only way mm, when Jesus comes again, when Jesus comes, the only way we'll be able to go back with him is if we have been through the fire. The only way we'll be able to see him and be excited is if we have been through the fire and come out as gold, ready for his return. Silma, good morning and happy Sabbath. No worries, sis. We're happy that you are joining us. So family, I want to ask you this question. We have this understanding now of what it looks like to have faith in the midst of the fire, just like Job. I want to ask you this question. I want you to think, can you name some people that are invited to a wedding? As we're going through the rest of our lesson, we've come to this point, and I want to ask you to think about a wedding. Maybe your wedding. Maybe your child's wedding. Name some people that are invited to a wedding. For example, your best friends. They're probably in the wedding. Name some people that are invited to the wedding when your child is getting married or when you are getting married or when you got married, when you were writing that list with your potential or your fiance, name the people, your friends, the groups of people that you wanted to make sure were on that list. Pat says minister, friends and family. Exactly. Melanie, coworkers. Exactly. Gerald, coworkers. Aunt Debbie, Family and friends. Yes, sunshine. Dearest friends, family, acquaintances, work friends, and those you are getting closer to. Yes, anybody else you can think of. Elise, friends, family, coworkers, Lindell, your neighbors, your church family. Yes, people that we want to invite to our wedding, right? Or people you actually already invited when you got married. This is something that is important to think about. Who's on your list? Who are you inviting to your wedding? Now, why are we talking about those we're inviting to the wedding? I want us to go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. We just talked about people you're going to invite to the wedding. Matthew 25, verse 1 and 2. Shanette says, my neighbors, yes. So Matthew 25, verse 1 and 2, here we go. We're talking about a wedding. And Matthew 25, verses 1 and 2, they also talk about a wedding. Verse 1 says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. So we're naming individuals, neighbors, co-workers, family, friends. And then in this verse, verse 2, we see some fools and some wise people. Oh, why does the Bible say fools and why does the Bible say wise? This is what we need to understand as we continue going through our lesson today. Ed May, good morning. Friends, yes, Norman, hey, the Holy Spirit, hey, amen, be in, in there, in the midst, Lord, be in the midst, amen. So I want us to look at this real quick, family. The parable of the ten virgins from Matthew 25, verses 1 to 12. Now, I like how the lesson for Tuesday titled it, Jesus' Last Words. This was around the time right before Jesus was going to be crucified, and he was talking to the disciples, and he was giving them some parables. And one of the parables was the parables of the ten virgins. So let's break it down real quick. Jesus was in Jerusalem about to die. According to Matthew's gospel, 
Jesus' last teaching hour before Passover is spent telling his disciples parables, including the ones about the ten virgins and the sheep and the goats. These stories are related to the way we should live as we wait for Jesus to come. Thus, their relevancy to today with the signs of Jesus' soon return all around us has never been more significant. I loved that the lesson brought out this point. We've heard these parables before, but bringing out that point, the fact that before Jesus was crucified, he decided to tell these parables to his disciples shows us that they have an importance that we must understand, especially since we know Jesus is coming back soon. So let's check it out. Verse one, they were all focused on meeting the bridegroom. So the verse says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Very interesting. We have these 10 virgins and they were all each and every one of them. They were excited to see the bridegroom. They were ready to see the bridegroom. They were going to meet the bridegroom. Very important. Uh, thank you so much, Ed May. God bless you as well, my brother. Now, verse 2 brought out two groups, wise and foolish. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Again, remember, they were all looking for the bridegroom. But now we have this split, wise and foolish. So what characterized the wise and what characterized the foolish? Let's go into it a little bit deeper. Wisdom. According to the Bible, there are four verses. Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So we know that wisdom comes from God. James 1 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So we know. God giveth wisdom liberally. Again, we're trying to understand the characteristics of the wise virgins and the foolish virgins because both, both groups were looking for the bridegroom. But now we have this distinction and wisdom comes from God who gives it liberally. James 3.17 lets us know that it is from above and it is full of good fruits. And Ephesians 1.17 lets us know that God gives us the spirit of wisdom. So there's a connection between God and wisdom. What about foolishness? Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So foolishness is about despising wisdom and instruction. Again, remember, Two groups. These groups are both looking for the bridegroom's return. But now there's a distinction, wise and foolish. The wise, their wisdom comes from God, his instructions. The foolish, the Bible says, the foolish despise wisdom and instruction. Very interesting. Both groups are looking for the bridegroom. But the very source of wisdom is God is Jesus. And it says the foolish despise the wisdom, despise the instruction. Let's continue. Here we go. First Corinthians two fourteen. but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So foolishness is connected to not receiving or not understanding the leading of the Holy Spirit. Very interesting. Proverbs 22 verse 15, not having the rod of correction. And Proverbs 18 verse 2, not delighting in understanding. Now we're going to keep going deeper into this, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. Both groups are looking for the bridegroom. If this is making sense so far, hit the thumbs up for me real quick. I don't want to move forward if anyone's not understanding. If you're understanding, just hit the thumbs up or put a thumbs up in the comment section and I'll keep going deeper. But the key again, 
Both groups are looking for the bridegroom. Yo, he's coming back. Listen, the bridegroom's coming. Okay, I see. Good. Everyone's understanding. Praise God. One group, the wise, they know that wisdom comes from God. Instruction. The foolish despise wisdom. Still looking for God, but they despise wisdom and instruction. And we understand that instruction, the Holy Spirit leads. So there's something here. Both looking for the bridegroom, one is connected to the wisdom of God, the other despises wisdom. Let's go deeper, family. Let's go deeper. Uh, Robert says this, this part of the gospel, the part of growing up into the character of Christ, we avoid preaching and practicing, thus remain spiritual infants. Spiritual growth is Holy Spirit empowered character development in the similitude of Christ. Amen. But brother, don't be discouraged. That's why we're here in class. We are studying it. We're not avoiding it. Come on, bro. Don't worry. Stay encouraged. We are all growing together, even right now. Catherine, I have been foolish with my money, but I want wisdom. Go to, the God, to, go to God's word. He'll give you the wisdom you need, sis. Amen. Yes, amen. So let's go deeper. Here we go, family. Now we get into verse 3. Verses 3 and 4. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. All right. Again, understanding what's happening. Both groups looking for the bridegroom. We're both focused on the bridegroom, right? One group is wise. One group is foolish, which means one group is connected to God. The other group despises instruction. Then verses three and four say they both had vessels. They had their lamp. They had the light. Woo, Holy Spirit. They both had the light. They both had it. Listen, they had the little vessels. They were ready. We're going to see the, we're going to see the bridegroom. We're here. We're coming, right? Little vessels, just go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Oil lamps, right? Two groups looking for the return. Family, we have to understand this because we need to make sure we are a part of the right group because both groups are looking for his return. Both groups have the vessel, have the lamp right here. But the wise took oil. The foolish did not take oil. Wait a minute. What is this oil? Remember, before Jesus was sacrificed, before he was crucified, he said, I have to tell my disciples this parable. This parable is important for my children. Before my return, they need to understand it. So this is for you and I. So what does the oil represent? Because we all have the word of God. We're all looking for Jesus' return. Every Christian, yes, Jesus, come. I have your word. What's the oil? Here's the oil, family, according to God's word. A lamp, I did some research, a lamp is trimmed when the wick is turned either up or down to regulate the amount of flame. If a lamp is empty of oil, it does not matter how much one trims it. The lamp will go out when the oil is consumed. So we need to understand what this oil is because if the oil is gone, just like it says, the lamp will no longer burn. Here we go, family. What was oil used for? Let's backtrack. What was oil used for? Exodus 40, verse 9. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein, and shalt hollow it and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. According to God's word, oil was used to anoint. I want to make sure we all understand because when we understand, we'll be able to share it with someone else. So in the Bible, Exodus 40 verse nine, oil was used to anoint things. All right. So one thing the oil was used for was to anoint. Again, remember, we're trying to understand why the wise having oil was important and the foolish not having oil was a warning. Oil is used to anoint. What was also used to anoint in the Bible? Luke 4, verse 18 and 19. 
the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I just want to bring out. Y'all can't see me sometimes on camera when I'm reading, but sometimes this stuff just gets so good because God's word is so clear, family. God wants us to be saved. He wants us to be part of the wise group. This verse says that the Holy Spirit anoints people to preach the gospel and to spread it. So now we're seeing the Holy Spirit being the one that anoints. So if oil anoints, come on, family. I know you're seeing it. Come on now. Acts 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with them. Let me connect the dots. At the very beginning of the lesson, we talked about being in the image woo, of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. In the beginning, God created us in his image. His image is good, merciful, loving, kind. And now we're seeing Acts 10 38. When the Holy Spirit anoints an individual, he anoints an individual to go about doing good. That's exactly what happened when the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus. Jesus went about doing good. Everything is connected. So once again, family, the Holy Spirit anoints us to spread the gospel and God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the oil that the wise had and then the lack of oil for the foolish. Robert, yes, oil equals holy in power, Holy Spirit empowered character development. Character fit for heaven being practiced through love now, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the key. Good morning, Brenda. Good to see you, sis. Happy, uh, happy Sabbath, Udelka. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God is good. Good morning to you, Lori. Thank you so much, sis. I appreciate that. Come on. Praise God. God is anointed. Listen, I can feel the Holy Spirit. I love when the Holy Spirit takes over and it's not your girl. It's the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So let's keep going deeper, family. Here we go. So if wisdom means accepting and receiving instruction from God, how does the Holy Spirit connect to the oil for us? Listen, I love doing deep Bible study. What we're learning right now is not Tiff's opinion. It's literally from God's word. So I want to make sure we're all following along right here. It says John 16 verse 13. How be it when he, whoo, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall speak, excuse me, for whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come family. We need the Holy spirit. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance because just having the Bible, just looking for Jesus' return is not enough. It's not enough. Remember, the wise and the foolish waiting for the bridegroom. The wise and the foolish had their lamps. They had their vessels, but only the wise had enough oil to carry them after they woke up from their slumber. Family, we know about the church of Laodicea. I'm not going to lie to you. I think we're in that period right now. After COVID, it's kind of like, well, you know, we're all kind of, we're studying God's word, but there are those moments when you can study a little bit more. And God is letting us know we have to have the oil in order to make it to Jesus's return. Amen. The oil is the Holy Spirit. It cleanses and sanctifies us. Amen. Acts 10, 38. Amen. Amen. Continuing family. The oil equals a true understanding of God's word based on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. A true understanding. Just having God's word doesn't mean anything. I'm not going to lie to you. The devil knows this better than you or I. 
I'm going to say it again. The devil knows the words found in this book better than you or I. He's been around much longer. But what he doesn't have is the oil family. The devil does not have the oil of the Holy Spirit. So he might have the word, but just like when they were in uh, in, the, in the desert and he was uh, in the wilderness and he was trying to uh, get Jesus to actually bow down and worship him. He had the word, but whoo, Jesus had the Holy Spirit. We have to have the oil family in order for us to make it to the end of time. Even the devil knows the word of God. He used it when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, but Jesus was being led by the Holy Spirit. So we understood the true meaning of God's word. We must never forget that it's the leading of the Holy Spirit that helps us understand and apply God's word properly. This is what we must have, family. We are going to go through the fire. We're going to be tried, but as long as we have the Holy Spirit with us, we will make it. Amen. Yes, spirit and truth, we need them both. Amen. Amen. Edme, the Holy Spirit is the best gift to us from God. Amen. Antoinette, hey girl, happy Sabbath. I think one of the lessons from the parable of the 10 versions is linked to James 1 verses 2 to 4. Patience is also seen as endurance. So whilst both had the light fueled by the oil of the Holy Spirit, one group ran out. Could it be the foolish despised instructions? Huh. That's what it says, foolishness about finding joy in trials and to build faith and endurance. Wow. So for us, we need to adjust our thoughts and our feelings combined as our character is being formed as we go through the fire. We are being transformed and we endure as the Holy Spirit completes the work. Amen, sis. Aunt Debbie, we need to be Holy Spirit filled. We need to ask daily to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yes. Come on now. Hey, Sash. Amen. God is good. Yes. Praise him for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, Carol. Happy Sabbath. Praise God. The Holy Spirit is moving. God is truly, truly good. So here's the thing, family. Verse five to verse 11 talks about while the bridegroom tarried, they slumbered. They all slumbered. And then when they woke up, the five foolish asked the five wise for oil. But they said, no, nah, no, nah, you have to get your own. I can't give you oil just like you can't give me oil. I can give you the lamp. I can give you the vessel. But we each have to make sure we have the oil, the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. Verse 12. But he answered and said, when the bridegroom had come and the foolish did not have enough oil, he said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. Psalms 1 verse 6 says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And John 16, 13, God will know those that have been led by his Holy Spirit. Before Jesus was crucified, he wanted his disciples to understand the importance of the Holy Spirit. No longer would Jesus be with them to break down his word, but he was sending the Holy Spirit, the oil to open up their minds, to help them understand so they could receive instruction in a clear way. And God is saying the same to you and I, we must pray for the Holy Spirit. Just having God's word and looking for Jesus is not enough family. We must pray for God's Holy Spirit. No worries, no worries. Have a wonderful day at church, Shawnette. We'll see you next time. Have a good Sabbath. All right, family, let me ask you this question again. We're understanding now the importance of the Holy Spirit and the oil. I want to ask you this. Can you name some characteristics of a wise person? We just talked about the wise and the foolish and according to the Bible. But right now, as a human being in 2022, outside of the Bible, if you could give some characteristics of a wise person, I know a lot of times we say old people, they're the wise ones. Why? Because they've had many experiences and they've learned from them. What are some characteristics of a wise person? For example, a person that can choose his or her words wisely. 
knowing when to speak and when not to speak. That is wisdom. What are some other characteristics of a wise person? Robert, Romans 5, verses 1 to 5. The Holy Spirit given to us pours God's love into our hearts so we can endure the trials that transform us to look like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Aunt Debbie, they listen. Yes. Sunshine, a wise person is the one you can go to when you have serious questions that you have no answers to. True. Juanita, they give great advice. So true. Very true. Pat, someone who is able to see the long-term consequences to possible decisions. Amen. Antoinette says, yes, Robert. Silma, the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's up to us to connect with the Holy Spirit in us. We use the free will gift given to us to explore this vicious world, ignoring the powerful Holy Spirit that lives in us. This is the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave. Exactly. He wants to come and be in us and to lead and guide us. But if we don't listen, his voice gets quieter. Okay. So yes, definitely. We have to connect. Carol, thinking before speaking. Yes, a wise person. Richard, learning from others' mistakes. Yes. Tiff, they are disciplined, patient, and they take instruction humbly. Yes. <laughs> Mona Lisa, you took my answer, girl. <laughs> Knowing when and when not to speak. Exactly. Robert, the wise speak to bless others, even their adversaries. Catherine, they consult the Holy Spirit before their actions. Mm. Elise, patience and calmness in the time of trouble, pointing people to the Bible for instruction. Amen. Desiree, someone who can discern good from bad. Amen. Angela, a wise person has patience and does not try to persuade you, but lead you to the right answer. Yes. Brenda, a wise person is disciplined and can handle instruction humbly. Sophia, hey girl, good to see you. Wise or a wise person is not being quick to respond. True. And not responding harshly. So true. Robert, the wise contemplate second and third order effects of choices and statements. I missed something. Hold on. They contemplate and they think about the effects of their choices and their statements. Yes. So true. So we understand the characteristics and we know the characteristics of a wise person. I want us to jump to this verse family. Proverbs chapter 11 and I want us to look at verse 30. Proverbs chapter 11. And we're going to look at verse 30. Proverbs 11, verse 30. We're talking about the characteristics of a wise person. But Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30 tells us something very interesting. It says, trusting that all have found. Hold on one second. Silma says, a wise person listen, listens and is also open to learn from what they heard. Very true. Here we go. Verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now listen to this. And he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls for Christ is wise. Woo! If we look back at what we just studied, the five wise and the five foolish. We understood that breakdown and having the oil. Another characteristic of that wise group is the fact that they were winning souls. Again, it was a parable. Winning souls is an attribute, a characteristic of the wise. Let's get into it a little bit more, family, as we're bringing our lesson to a close soon. Here we go. Wednesday's lesson, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The focus verse is this one. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Another comment came through humble, talking about those that are wise, thoughtful, operating with integrity and principle, resourceful, open to learning, available to listen, seeking understanding, striving to emulate the character of God. Amen, Chi. I think it's your first time. If so, welcome, brother. Good to see you. And may a wise person puts God first in everything. Amen. Amen. So verse three, two words are brought out. The first one is wise. Now the Hebrew for this word is, it means to be circumspect and intelligent, to instruct or teach, to make, to understand, or to guide wittingly. Remember, 
when Jesus returns, uh, at an attribute of the group is that they are considered to be wise. So we're seeing wise in the Hebrew again means to instruct or teach, to make, to understand. Look at Proverbs 11 verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Winning souls is equated to being wise. And James 5 verse 20, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins, saving souls from death. This is all connected to being wise. Let me go back. Let's do a quick summary. We learned that the wise have the word of God. They're looking for Jesus' soon return. They have the oil, meaning they're following the leading of the Holy Spirit. As they're studying the Bible, just like we're doing right now, we're letting the Holy Spirit lead us. But now we're seeing that the wise are also working hard to win souls for Christ. We're looking at the attributes, the characteristics of individuals looking truly for the soon return of Jesus. Remember, we all want to be a part of the wise group. And let me break it down like this. Saving souls from death. So some practical ways that we can win souls for Christ. Now, we're not going to get into this right now because of time. I actually have to go um, and go to church after class today. So we have to end a little bit earlier, but I'll still put the question on the screen as a rhetorical question. Think of some practical ways that we can win souls for Christ. Now, hold on one second. A comment came through Robert to bless someone with access to eternal life is the best gift we can give anyone winning souls. Amen, brother. Now, another word that came out in this verse, verse three is shine. Now, according to the Hebrew, it means to gleam, to enlighten by caution, to admonish, to teach, or to give warning. Family, we're literally getting the purpose for our life from these verses. Why are we here today? Why are we still alive? We know Jesus is coming soon. We have his word. We're praying for the Holy Spirit's guidance. And as he guides us, he leads us to try to win souls for Christ. And he leads us to also caution people, admonish people that Jesus is coming soon. This is all from God's word, not Tiff's opinion. Another comment, Philip, in Wednesday's lesson, we look at the importance of character for those waiting for the second coming. Oh, I'm not going to put this up. We haven't got to Thursday yet. Not there yet. (laughs) Good to see you, Philip. All right, let's go back. Proverbs 4, verse 18. Our lives should lead others to God, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And Matthew 13, 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear. Let him hear the righteous will shine and our lives should lead others to God. So now we're seeing again, the wise will shine. We are looking for God. We have his word. We have the oil of the Holy spirit. We want to spread that to others and we shine when we warn others, when we admonish them, not about hell fire, but instead about, listen, God loves you. Jesus is coming soon. Please come to an understanding of his love. This is what makes us shine in this world. And God is calling for us to be lights in this world. The wise is a person set apart for holy use. Amen. Hey, brother Johnson. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Elijah, what to do, brother? Yes, God is truly good, family. Continuing, we know this now. Jesus, what did he do while he was on the earth? Matthew 4, verse 23 lets us know that Jesus taught, he preached, and he healed. What are we supposed to be doing while on the earth? Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. The great commission. We are to teach people to observe God's commands. Family, God is calling his children to live as his son lived. He wants us to teach others his word and to win souls. This is what will characterize God's children when Jesus returns. 
We have to go through the fire, just like we talked about in the beginning. And God will bring us out as pure gold. And part of us, as we're waiting for Jesus' return, part of the characteristics that we need to make sure we are emulating, again, winning souls for Christ, asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand his word even more. Definitely we keep you in prayer. Oh, Susan, we'll definitely keep you in prayer, sis. We're glad to see you this morning, but we will definitely pray for you. Elijah says praying for you, definitely. Robert, growing up spiritually, our, uh, grow up spiritually ourselves and love people the way God loves us. Amen. Mingle with others, listening to them, meeting their needs, winning their confidence, and then telling them about the goodness of God and the plan of salvation. Amen. Praying for you that you receive healing, Susan, from Antoinette. Amen. Let me ask this question, family, as we're bringing our lesson to a close. Can you name some things that people do in groups? We've been talking about, you know, spreading the gospel and listening to the Holy Spirit, but can you name some things that people do in groups, some group activities? For example, there's group Bible studies. There's choirs, people singing together. What are some other things that people do in groups? Uh, playing sports, right? What are some other things that people do in groups? It is the example we set by our behaviors and actions, the best proclamation uh, for the gospel of truth we have to share. Yes, our actions. Amen. Richard, playing sports. Elijah, yes, sports. Here we go. Pat, playing games, sharing a meal and studying. Yes. Lauren, basketball. Exactly. Mona Lisa, camping. Yes, Elise. Hold on, another one came through. Elise says, eating, Bible study, prayer, and exercise. Elijah, working. Kim, studying. Hey, Kim. Melanie, coaching, my business. Okay, I see you put it out there, girl. I like that. Garfield, camping. Donanita, witnessing. Catherine, prayer, prayers are going up for you, Susan. Yes. Richard, meals. Yes. Elijah, breaking bread. Brenda, community outreach. Robert, cooking, hunting, and playing. Desiree, Eating and going to restaurants. Yanni, hey Yanni, studying. Philip, skating or bowling. Yes. Antoinette, exercising um, and having great discussions. Richard, traveling. Laana, traveling. Yes. Yudelka, yoga. Gerald, praying for your healing and recovery, Susan. Um, yes. Amen. Lauren, it didn't come through. Can you send it again, hon? Here we go. Edme, debating about a current subject. Yes, Tanisha, supporting groups for issues. Oh, support groups for issues they are going through. True. And Laana, traveling. Family, there are so many things we can do together as a group. So what does this verse tell us? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. As we're bringing our lesson to a close, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 11. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Verse 11. Another one came through. Traveling, mourning, yes. Suffering together in trials and encouraging one another. Yes, Elise. Udelka, support groups. Lori, celebrate together. Very true. Verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Wherefore, Comfort yourselves together, the support groups, and edify one another. Celebrate each other, even as also ye do. Things to do together as a community. Now, as we're bringing our lesson to a close, this point becomes very important. The importance of a community. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Verse 11 he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, all for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5 and 12, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is, greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except ye interpret that the church may receive edifying. Continuing to verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, here's the key. Seek that ye may excel in order to edify the church. Basically, the focus should be on the edifying of the body of Christ. 
And 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, we just read again, focuses on edifying each other. It's very interesting. Edifying the church, edifying the body, focusing on the community. Real quick pause. Isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't he come down to this earth to sacrifice his life for the benefit of the body? Remember, we are made in God's image. Most deaf, Jeremy, I hope your class goes well, bro. I'll talk to you later. Happy Sabbath to you. Yes, celebrate the success of another. Amen. Amen. Continuing family. Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's a song that we used to sing back in the day. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Some of you remember that song, but it's talking about we are a body. We are a community. So it's not just about, listen, I'm going to get mine from the Bible. I'm going to make sure me and God are straight. You do you, boo. I'm going to do me. No, this verse and these verses are letting us know, listen, we are to care about the body of Christ. We're to pull each other up to help each other along the way. The importance of community. John 17, 21 says, Jesus wants us to be one just like he is one with God. And Philippians 2 verses 1 to 3. These verses let us know that we are to esteem each other and be one. Why is this idea of community so important. When Paul writes to the Ephesians, he describes the church as a body. Jesus is the head and his people make up the rest. If you look at Ephesians 4:13, you'll notice the ultimate purpose. Again, the ultimate purpose of living in a community is to experience the whole measure. What? Come on now. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And in order to do that, in order for that to happen, we need each other. Paul is wanting to emphasize a critical truth. Ultimately, we experience and reveal the fullness of Christ when we are working together in fellowship with each other and family. That is how the lesson ended for this week, focusing on each other as a community. It started off reminding us that we are created in the image of God and God needs us to think about being merciful and kind and loving each other. And he needs us to remember the parables. He needs us to remember what Job went through and how Job remembered he was going through the fire and the fire is to bring us out as pure gold, the image that God initially wanted us to be in. And as we're going on this journey, we have to remember to have the oil, the Holy spirit breaking down God's word, but we must never forget. This is not just us and God. We need to also remember that we are a body. We are a family. I like the way you put that. Just like family, you learn patience as your siblings get on your nerves. That does happen, yes. But yes, family, we have to remember that we're not alone. We should help each other along the way. Lashana, hey girl, thank you, Tiff. This was really good. Love you as well. Praise God. Now, family, that is all I have for you all this morning. If there are any final thoughts or any prayer requests, I ask that you put them in the comment section. I am going to do the prayer a little faster than normal. Again, I need to uh, run to church, but I do pray that you were blessed. I truly was blessed um, from the lesson, and I hope you were blessed this morning. So any final thoughts, any prayer requests, please put them in the comment section, and then I will close with prayer. Antoinette, thanks for the rich discussion. Praise God, sis. I am so filled from all the sharing. God bless you, Tiff, and the family. Amen. Yes, this family, we help each other grow in Christ. Aunt Debbie, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all work together for us all. Amen. Mona Lisa, thank you, sis, teaching the lesson today. Pray for me. Definitely got you my prayers, sis. 
Praise God. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Lauren, this was excellent. Praise God. Praise God for letting you, uh, letting him use you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, girl. God is good. Thanks so much, Robert. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Most deaf. God is truly good. Yes, the Holy Spirit was definitely here today. God is good. Prayers for the body of Christ. Amen. Excellent and powerful, powerful lesson. Praise God. Praying for your family, Tiff. My inbox. Yes, I'm so sorry. This week was a little bit hectic. I'll check your in my inbox, Tiff. Kim, always a pleasure. Amen. All right, family, let's bow for prayer, and then we will see each other next week. God, thank you again so much for showing us your power, Lord, and for revealing so much to us today throughout this lesson. We ask that you please be with us for the next seven days, Lord. Help us to remember your word. I ask that you be with all the prayer requests, Lord, those that are silent, Lord. Be with Susan, Lord. She put a prayer request out earlier, God. She's in the hospital. We ask that you heal her body. Be with those that are around her as well. Please be with Mona Lisa and her family, God, and Mark. Be with all of the other prayer requests that came in. Be with Tiff and her family, Lord. And every other prayer request, we ask that you please hear them and answer them according to your will. Be with us throughout the rest of the Sabbath day and the rest of the week. And help us to come back together next week ready to dive even deeper into your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Family, thank you so much again. I appreciate each and every one of you. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath, and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.